As we stand, why don't we pray together? Our great um, and loving Father, we thank you for that, that wonderful hope that we've been able to sing together, sing to one another. Uh, that one day, um, those of us that are hidden in the Lord Jesus, when he appears, uh, will appear with him. Uh, thank you for that wonderful hope. Thank you that you, uh, as we've heard throughout this evening, you've done everything uh, to make us yours. And as we think through what it might look like for us to speak about you publicly, uh, I pray that you'd wrestle, uh, wrestle with our hearts together this evening. Um, please correct and rebuke. Please encourage us. Um, conform us more and more into the image of your son. Uh, because I ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. Um, let me add my welcome. Uh, my name's Steve. Uh, I'm from Beeston down the road, uh, one of the leaders at Rylands Community Church. And it's my privilege to uh, share God's word uh, with you this evening. I'd love you to have a Bible in front of you if you've got one or a screen with a Bible passage on it. That would be really helpful. Colossians um, chapter, uh, mainly chapter uh, 3, 1 to 4, and then 4, 2 to 6. Uh, but as you, um, as you look that up, do you have this experience um, of avoiding um, important things because, well, you're a little bit lazy or you're not quite sure how to process them uh, or you just think there's better things that you could be doing even though you know they're important? It's the kind of feeling you get when, uh, I don't know, the news comes on or question time is about to start. You know it's probably something as a grown-up that you, you should watch and engage with. Uh, but if you're honest, you'd much rather get another episode of the American office under your belt or, or whatever it is uh, that you turn to. Uh, so when Rue asked me to speak, um, he said, um, we're looking for something encouraging on mission and personal evangelism. And I thought, well, let's turn, turn the channel over. Um, and maybe that's your instinct, as you heard this passage read, or as Rob said, we're going to be thinking uh, about mission. We know it's something we should be committed to, something that we should be passionate about. Uh, if you're a student, and if you're a student in your third year, you've probably heard this many times, that university is one of the best opportunities you'll ever have to talk publicly about Jesus, so make the most uh, of events week, and by the way, eight o'clock is not early for a prayer meeting. <laughs> uh, repent of that laziness. <laughs> but if you're honest, you'd much rather like catch up on your box set, wouldn't you? Or play FIFA, or, or whatever it is that's your bag. I know that feeling. I'm not here speaking as someone that is like the super evangelist in Nottingham, uh, but someone that's trying to find their way in what it means to speak publicly about Jesus. Uh, and what I really don't want to do tonight is beat you up. I don't want to give the talk. I don't know if you've heard this talk that uh, people talk about evangelism. Imagine that you're a doctor uh, and you discover the cure for cancer. Well, you wouldn't keep it to yourself, would you? You'd tell everyone. Well, the gospel's better news than can the cure for cancer, isn't it? So, so why aren't we telling more people? Uh, but when we hear that illustration, it might resonate for a little while, but often I think, well, the reason I'm not telling more people is it's hard. Uh, it's discouraging. Uh, unlike a cure for cancer, people aren't, you know, desperate for it. In fact, it's increasingly something people really don't want to hear about. Or maybe you're here this evening, sort of the student days are in the, in the past, uh, and you're just tired when it comes to talks like this. A bit worn out from the, the no's to the events that you keep being asked to invite people to. Uh, worn out with the, the son or daughter that's just not interested. Uh, worn out with the friends who, the, the conversations have long since passed, being able to talk about Jesus. Well, for reluctant evangelists like us, there's, one, there's wonderful hope, I think, in these uh, few short verses. 
There's so much to encourage us. Uh, and it should encourage us because this is uh, Paul's instructions from the letter of the Colossians, which if you know the letter of the Colossians, is a book that's written to encourage believers who felt like that they were failing in the Christian life. It felt like they were disqualified because they didn't have particular spiritual experiences or that they they belonged to the wrong groups or didn't uh, do the right things. Felt disqualified, felt discouraged, felt judged by other people, felt like, oh, maybe we're missing out on something. And maybe we're not, maybe we haven't got all of God. And so when Paul writes this book and these words of instruction, it's not to beat the Colossians up, to make them feel bad. No, he's unpacking, what does it look like when you've got hold of Jesus? What does life look like when uh, he's taken hold of you? It's why I wanted those first four verses of chapter three read, because chapter four, two to six, flow out of... Uh, this new section in the letter where Paul's sort of unpacking, this is what it, what it means to belong to Jesus. And so the first thing as we think about mission, the first thing we're to do before we talk to anybody else is talk to ourselves about Jesus, verses 1 to 4. Talk to yourself about Jesus. Look down at chapter 3, 1 to 4 again. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Those four verses kind of unpacking um, really what we've been singing about this evening. Uh, They're kind of a summary of uh, chapters 1 to 2. He's basically saying, look, everything I've been saying in chapters 1 to 2 Get your mind set on those things. Uh, Get your affections. Get your affections being moved by those truths about Jesus. Set your mind on how he's the supreme Lord, the one who made everything and owns everything, the one who, that everything exists for him. Uh, the head of the, the old creation that he made and the head of the new creation, the church. Set, set your mind on him and who he is. And set your mind and your affections on the fact that, that you are in him and that you've died with him and you've been raised with him, that his death has paid for all your sins. He has qualified you to share in his kingdom. You are qualified. See, the Colossians were a young church being persuaded that Jesus wasn't enough, that to be really spiritual, to be, to be full of God, you had to follow certain rules, do certain festivals, make sure you were at the right conferences, singing the right songs, doing a church a particular way, being part of events week. Well, that's what really spiritual people do. And Paul says, well, it just basically blows raspberries in chapters one and two at that idea. He says, Jesus is the supreme Lord, the sufficient Savior. He says, all of God is in Jesus. And if you're in him, you've been brought to fullness. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, everything you're after in these, this extra teaching and these extra ideas, it's, it's all in him. Be rooted and built up in him. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, he says. Uh, My my favorite painting is a painting by Rembrandt called The Return of the Prodigal. Um, If you know it, you'll know how stunning it is. Uh, And it's really sad that I've still not been able to see it live. It's in a museum in St. Petersburg, and I'd love to go and see it one day. Uh, But um, like many of, like Rembrandt or other great um, masters, uh, their works are kind of scattered, aren't they, all over the world in museums here and there. But imagine if there was just one museum where all of Rembrandt's paintings and his sketches and his notes, where everything he'd ever painted and done, where, where it was placed where you could spend months or years probably studying his works, piecing together like who he was. 
That would be the place to go, wouldn't it? And if you had access to that, you, you wouldn't need anything else. Well, that's what the word hidden in Colossians mean. Not hidden in that there are treasures to be found that we've got to go and look for, but rather treasures that are stored up, ready to be explore. And if we're trusting Jesus this evening, then all of the treasure that's found in the infinite God of the universe are there in Jesus, hidden in him. So we don't live the Christian life to, to get closer to him, to experience more of him, to prove ourselves to him. No, we've got all of him. And it's speaking, our speaking about Jesus flows out of knowing him. Uh, in Daniel 11, Daniel says this, that the people who stand firm and take action are those who know their God. It's what Paul prays. Just flick back a page to chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, this is Paul's prayer for the Colossians. He says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with his knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every, work, every way, bearing fruit in every good work. The life that's pleasing to God is lived because you're filled up with a knowledge of God that comes through Jesus. So I guess here's the, here's the challenge, if you like. If you feel like you're lacking zeal in evangelism, if you feel that your love for unbelievers is cold, if you're indifferent to how your life looks to the outside world... It's likely because you are not setting your mind and your heart on all that you have in the Lord Jesus. Uh, you're in the museum with all the treasure, but you've got your eyes closed. Or you're scrolling on Instagram feeds or, or whatever it is, not looking up. See, how you feel about evangelism, how you're doing in evangelism says nothing about your standing before the Lord. Jesus qualifies you to share in his kingdom. But it might say something about the deep, or the, the reality of your walk with Jesus. How mature you are. See, if we want to make the most of Events Week, if as Cornerstone Church, we want to be a church that reaches this city for Jesus wants to see his kingdom grow and spread in the, the offices that you work, uh, the playgrounds that you sort of set your kids free in on a, on a Monday morning, uh, the friends that you've got, the, the neighbours that you live with, the sports teams that you play for. If you want to be brave and courageous and see the gospel go to the nations, then brothers and sisters, talk to yourself about who Jesus is and all that he's done. Set your mind Set your affections on him. That's how Paul introduces this section. Talk to yourself about Jesus. And then chapter 4, verses 2 to uh, 4. As you do that, as you, set your, as you talk to yourself about Jesus, start talking to Jesus about people. That's what he says in 2 to 4. Just look down at that with me. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. See, talking to God about other people is a big theme in this letter. We've already seen it in chapter 1, verse 9. We saw where Paul is praying for the Colossians, ceaselessly praying for them. Uh, at the end of the letter, it comes up again. Just look over the page to chapter 4, verse 12. He reminds them of Epaphras. He probably planted the church in Colossae. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he's working hard for you and for those at Laodicea. See, part of what it means to live with Jesus' Lord is to talk to Jesus about other people. And here Paul says, look, as you take hold of who you are in Jesus, 
Be devoted in praying for others. Be watchful and thankful. I think what he means there is be watchful of the ways in which we might drift from Jesus. Be thankful for all that you have in Jesus and pray uh, pray that people would know who they are in Jesus. That'd be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it, to pray for the Christians on the university campuses, to be praying that, that they would know the Christian students, that is, that they would know who they are in Jesus. That they'd be setting their minds and their affections on him. That they'd be watchful of all the ways in which they might drift from him. Be watchful and thankful. Devote yourselves to prayer. Uh, and then verse uh, 3 says, Pray for us too that, doors, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. I find this little prayer really encouraging. Because I think, we often think that it would probably have been easy for Paul to speak about Jesus, like the great apostle set apart to take the gospel to the Gentiles. That he just found himself at the Areopagus preaching to the Athenian philosophers. That he, it was easy when he you know, rented out the lecture hall of Tyrannus and spoke all day, or all these amazing opportunities that came his way. But according to Paul, that wasn't true. It wasn't because he was extroverted, necessarily. He might have been, I don't know. It wasn't because he was good at twisting a conversation to make a, make a point about Jesus. No, it's because he had lots of people praying for him. Praying that God would open doors for the message to be proclaimed. Praying that he would speak clearly. Presumably because he was tempted to not speak clearly. It'd be easy for him to not be clear because it appears that because he's been speaking clearly, he's in chains. <laughs> he's being persecuted, locked up for his, his proclamation about Jesus. So pray that I would speak it clearly as I must, as I should. I must be clear about Jesus. Pray for open doors and pray that I would speak clearly. Now, obviously, we're not to apply this directly. We're not to pray for the Apostle Paul anymore. Uh, he's enjoying life with Jesus. But I think we are to be devoted to keep asking God to open doors for Paul's message, the message of the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 5, that's being proclaimed all over the world, that's bearing fruit and growing. That's what we're to pray for, for open doors. And it's not an easy thing to do, no, Epaphras has to wrestle in prayer for the Colossians. Now, the Colossians here are to be devoted in prayer, to give themselves to it, to be deliberate about it. It's not going to be easy. You're not going to have to get up as early as 8 o'clock, are we? Goodness. No, we're going to have to devote ourselves to prayer. And so we pray for doors for that message to be opened in people's lives. And we're to pray that others will teach it clearly, as they should. That would be a great thing to pray for Mission Week, wouldn't it? That God would open doors for the message. And for those who are speaking publicly on a platform, that they would proclaim it clearly. But for every member of the University Christian Union, that when they have that conversation, that they would speak clearly about Jesus. Just as I'm speaking, maybe you could think of a, a friend in the CU that you could pray for right now, that for opportunities, that you, you know they've struggled with their housemates or their sports friends to have opportunities. Maybe you could just pray, Lord, this week, would that person, would they say yes to coming to that event? Or as you think about your I Am Mark event, maybe just right now as I'm speaking, just stop listening to me and pray, Lord, open a door. For the message, and please would you help us to speak clearly? And not just for this week or for this event, no, devoted to prayer, to always be doing that. Not as a hoop to jump through, not as a means to twist God's arm to bless you. 
but because you're in Jesus. And you're hidden in him. You can't be any closer to God than you already are. You're, you're in the museum with all the treasures. And, and he's saying, look, talk to me about this. Talk to me about people. Uh, I've worked with um, university students before. Uh, and I love, love the creativity that CUs have in putting on events for people. I love the, the courage to do it and to do it well, to stick a marquee in the middle of campus or however, however it will get done. Uh, but, and while it's, it's entirely right to work hard to put on events, to make it easy for people to walk through a door, it's God who opens up doors in people's lives. It's him that grants repentance and faith. So let's be praying for God to do that. And not just for Events Week, obviously, but for your mission friends and partners here at Cornerstone, for for the Mums and Todds groups, for the youth ministry, for, for whatever it is, that God would open up doors. Friends, we're, we're as close to God as we could possibly be in Jesus. And the fact that he's asked us to pray like this in his word suggests that he's, he's ready to answer this prayer. So as we talk to ourselves about Jesus, let's talk to Jesus about people and ask him to open doors, which takes us to our third and final point. As we do that, we are to talk to people about Jesus. Talk to ourselves about Jesus. Talk to Jesus about people, but we are to talk to people about Jesus. Look down at verse 5. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We're to be wise in the way that we act. It's really helpful instruction, isn't it? Be wise in the way that you act. Look, if you're praying for opportunities, well, just think about how your life looks to the people that you're wanting to speak to. Uh, We shouldn't expect people to listen to us talk about the lordship of Jesus and his grace if our lives don't look any different from anybody else. If it's not obvious that Jesus is Lord. That's what verses 1 to 4 are about in chapter 3. Live out the Christian life. Verses 5 to 11, put to death the things that are earthly in you and put on godliness. See, uh, these verses of be wise in the way that we act towards outsiders, like assume that we're living out this Christian life where we're pursuing love and not lying to each other, uh, where we're working hard in our jobs because we're living for Jesus as our master rather than anybody else. Verse 6, as we, Paul says, that you may know how to answer everyone, that assumes questions. Questions like, well, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you live the way that you live? Why, why, are you got, why have you got those priorities? It's in the nitty-gritty of our lives that the opportunities that we're praying for come, I think. It's how God opens the doors. So to be wise in the way that we act, but also we're to be... Uh, we're to let our conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt. I think what Paul means here is that we're to be concerned for the individuals that we're wanting to speak to, or concerned for the group of people that we want to speak to. That our words are gracious and and salty. Uh, They're marked by the grace that we've been shown in Jesus, but they, they make a difference to the people that we're listening to. So, for example... You come across someone with the question, how can a loving God allow suffering in the world? And it seems obvious to say, doesn't it, that some people ask that question from from an armchair, from the comfort of an armchair, and, and others ask that question from the discomfort of a wheelchair. And so how you answer that person... Well, it takes thought, doesn't it? It takes wisdom, it takes grace, it takes concern for them as an individual. What's their question, really? 
you might meet people, students, this week, who are really hostile to the Christianity, hostile to the Christian union, hostile to the, the Christian worldview. And it might be not because they're angry people, but because they've been really hurt in the past by the church or Christians. And as you face that hostility, be gracious, be wise. Who are they? What's their story? How am I going to answer them? One writer puts it like this, commenting on these verses. He says, In a fallen world, truth cannot go out unadorned and remain what it is. When truth is spoken apart from beauty, it's not really truth anymore. So let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Our words are to be lovely, seasoned with salt, suited and adapted to each occasion or person. I think that's really good news. It's really liberating news, as you, particularly as you think about events week, because it means that when you pray for God to open doors for that message and that, that opportunity comes, you don't have to, excuse the image, I'm sorry if this is a bit irreverent, but you don't have to vomit the gospel over them. It's the only way I can think of putting it, because I think that's what we do sometimes. Uh, I got this really wrong um, many, many years ago now, still getting it wrong today, but this is one that stuck in my mind. I had a a really good friend that I worked with, uh, and we went out as a group of mates um, uh, around Beeston when there was a McDonald's on Beeston High Street. That was a happy day. That was a happy day. That's where I put all my weight on. Um, Anyway, we went, uh, we were out around Beeston. Uh, and at the end of the evening, we went back to their house, a few of us, and sort of got into conversation. Um, and she said to me, she says, you're a Christian, Steve. Can you, like, what do you think about, like, hell? And at the time, uh, at the church that I was at then, Beeston Free Church, we'd been learning something that is now familiar called Two Ways to Live, which is a sort of a gospel outline. And I got really excited because I've been praying for opportunities And so I got my little bit of paper, and if you know two ways to live, you know that you have to sort of draw boxes, and you start with creation, and then the fall, and then like Jesus, and how he died, and how he's coming again, and there are two ways to live, and you need to make... I was very excited. I went through all my boxes. Here was my opportunity. And as I looked up, Sarah, who's thankfully still my friend, was in floods of tears, And it wasn't because what I'd said had been profound and persuasive. No, she was in floods of tears, and she says, so you think think my two-year-old is going to hell, do you? My two-year-old nephew is going to hell. See, her question was about her two-year-old nephew who was dying. And she wanted to know what the future might be like for someone like that. And sadly, 25 years on, I've still not had a gospel conversation with Sarah, not really. It wasn't wise. It wasn't gracious. It wasn't salty. In contrast to my wife, who's a much better evangelist than me, uh, about 10 years ago, I was walking over the railway bridge in, in Beeston, near to where we live, and I can't remember what had happened in the news, um, but there, something had, some war or something had started that was hitting the headlines. Uh, and her friend said to, said to Katie, my wife, I just can't believe in a God when things like this happen. Uh, and Katie, as quick as a flash, <laughs> just said, Do you know, I know what you mean, but I'm really glad I believe in God. Because I, it means I can be confident there'll be justice one day. That was wise. That was gracious. It was salty. You see, we talk to ourselves about Jesus. We talk to Jesus about people. And as he opens doors in the nitty-gritty stuff of life, in the everyday conversations, in the events that we put on, whatever it is, we make the best use of time 
by being thoughtful about who we're speaking to, by being gracious and holding out Jesus in the best way that we can. And we make, so we make the best use of time. We, we need to be urgent about it. Today, today is the day of salvation. So brothers and sisters, as you're watchful and prayerful and thoughtful about the people around you, then let's pray for God to open doors for us to speak about Jesus. Or if I can put it like this, don't waste events week. You really have a wonderful opportunity to talk about the Lord Jesus to share him with your friends. Uh, don't waste the opportunity. Don't waste, if you're not a student don't, or anyone, don't waste the relationships that God's put around you. Don't say people's no's for them when, before inviting them to an event. Talk to yourself about Jesus. Talk to Jesus about those people and then make the most of the opportunity. Because this is how his kingdom spreads and grows. We need to stop. So let me pray. Let's bow our heads and, and pray together. Lord Jesus, would you help us to keep talking to ourselves about who you are and all that you've done? Please flood our hearts with assurance that we belong to you because of the qualifying work of Jesus in his death and resurrection. Thank you that we've been brought to fullness in him. And as we do that, um, our great father, would you help us to talk to you about the people around us, the people that we might share a house with, the people in our sports teams, colleagues at work, neighbors down the road, family members. Please, Lord, this week, uh, in all of our lives, in all the, uh, the diversity of the lives that are represented here, please would you open doors for the message this week. And please would you help us speak clearly about you. Help us to be wise. Help us to be gracious. And please, Lord, would the kingdom grow as a result as you use ordinary, reluctant evangelists like us, uh, would many come to know and trust in the Lord Jesus and find life in him? Because I ask it in his name. Amen.